My name is Barry Kitterman, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all tonight to our evening with Richard Bausch. Um, to begin, I'm going to ask the stand and request if you have a cell phone that you turned off or somehow disabled it. That would be very uh, considerate of you. And <clears throat> I'm going to ask that <clears throat> if you also uh, would not take flash photography during the evening out of consideration for our guest this evening. I want to make a quick announcement, a note about upcoming events. On uh, Tuesday, November 23rd, we will have our annual Bread and Words reading and benefit. This is something that the Department of Languages and Literature and the Creative Writing Program has done every year for the last 16 years. Um, we will be in the ballroom, and we will be there, not that group across the hall. <laughs> we have it in Zurich. Uh, it's a wonderful night. The Tuesday before Thanksgiving, we all get together. Uh, members of our department and friends of our department bring big pots of hot soup and chili and loaves of bread, and uh, we have a poetry and uh, prose reading and some music <coughs> with Chuck Emery, and maybe some guests. <clears throat> and we ask for a, a small donation, $5, at the door. And all that money goes to an agency here in Clarksville <clears throat> that uh, fights hunger. And in the past, we've been making our donation to loaves and fishes. I think this year we might make our donation to the Salvation Army. Uh, they also have a, a need, and they provide uh, meals and food to those in this community who don't have enough. So we invite you all to come and be with us. If you'd like to make a pot of soup, you could talk to me or Susan Walsh, and Susan in the back. Um, um, all donations are welcome. Uh, we have a lot of fun. So <coughs> tonight it's my pleasure to introduce Richard Bausch, who comes to us from Memphis, where he holds the Moss Chair of Excellence <coughs> in the writing program at our sister institution, the University of Memphis. Richard is the author of 19 works of fiction, I guess 19 books, 19 <laughs> stories, um, and including, most recently, a, a terrific novel titled Peace, about the uh, last uh, weeks of the war, of World War II in Italy, and an equally terrific collection of stories, Something is Out There, my students have been reading this week from this book. <clears throat> His work has appeared in such prestigious publications as the Atlantic Monthly, Esquire, Harper's, New Yorker, Playboy, Best American Short Stories, the O. Henry Prize Stories, and the Pushcart Prize Stories. He's won two National Magazine Awards, a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Fund Writers Award, <coughs> the Award of the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and the 2004 Penn Malamud Award for Excellence in the Short Story. And for his novel, Peace, he won the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. Uh, that's a lot of, of, of good stuff. It really is. <coughs> Richard has been with us on campus today meeting with classes holding us enthralled with stories and anecdotes. It seems like all we've done today is eat and talk about writing, which are two of my favorite things to do. <laughs> but I'm convinced that there's no end to the topics on which Richard Bausch could keep me entertained. The man has a passel of gifted children, an elderly aunt who tells the best dirty jokes, <laughs> he has an encyclopedic knowledge of just about everyone writing in America today, including his own twin brother, Robert, who is also an accomplished author. So Richard, I'm going to be sorry to see you go, and I hope you'll be back in Clarksville again soon. Please welcome Richard. <laughs> Man in the 
hospital is extremely shy, very retiring, he's having digestive troubles. He's trying very hard not to have to use the bathroom where the nurses or doctors would have to help him. And he ends up with a terrible accident. And he's got sewage on the sheets. Just wraps them up terrified. The nurses are coming and throws it out the window. And it hits a drunk in the street. And the drunk has a terrible dervish like, ah, like that. He gets it off of him and it's at his feet. And the cop says, what the hell was that? And the drunk says, I don't know. I think I just beat the shit out of a ghost. <laughs> I should also say quickly that this story came from talking to a former student, and we were talking about, I was talking about a great James Whitehead poem about <coughs> writers, and the last line of the poem is, we all came from the wound. And I was saying that was such an amazing use of the cliche and turning it into something else. And then I said, I don't really remember being wounded so much. I had a really happy, you know, adventurous, fun, there's always something going on in the house. There were six of us as children. We had, you know, a mother and father who loved us. They gave a damn what happened to us. And uh, this didn't ever make us feel like we were all as poor as we were. I mean, we didn't even own a car when I was nine. But we never felt any of that. It was just fun. And, uh, and uh, so I said, I don't remember any of that. And he said I was pummeled as a teenager. And I laughed. I thought that was funny. And I said, you should start a story with that. He said, we should, we should both write a story with that as the open line and see where it takes us, which was, an, I thought, an excellent idea. And it goes back to Peter Taylor and, and Robert Lowell and, and um, uh, Randall Jarrell at a writing conference where somebody turned in a line, a story, the opening line was, he wanted no more of her drunken palaver. And they were laughing at how bad the line was. And Randall Jarrell said to Peter Taylor, even you, who are the most talented of us, could possibly have written uh, or write a short story with the opening line. He would have have no more. He wanted no more of her drunken palaver. And Taylor took the bed and went home and wrote a story called The Fancy Woman, the opening title of which, the opening line of which is he wanted no more of her drunken palaver. So um, I said, let's do that. We'll do that Peter Taylor thing. We'll write this. So he wrote a story called Fat Tracy. I wrote this. Both stories were published, and somewhere, sometimes, some poor scholar is going to find it and go, what the hell is this? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's the way the story opens. It's all I had when I started it, and uh, then I just let the story tell me what I wanted to do. Nobody in Hollywood. I was pummeled as a teenager. For some reason, I had the sort of face that asked to be punched. It seemed to me in those days that everybody wanted to take a turn. Something about the curve of my mouth, I guess, made me look up like I was being cute with people smirking at, at them. I am what is called a late life child. My brother Doke is 20 years older and played semi-pro football. But by the time I came along, Doke was through as a ball player, and my father had given up on ever seeing a son play pro. 
I was a month premature and very, very tiny as a child. Dad named me Ignatius after an uncle of his that I never knew. Of course, I didn't take to sports, though I could run pretty fast. That comes with having a face people want to hit. <laughs> I liked to read. I was the family bookworm. I'm four feet nine inches tall. Dope married young, divorced young, and had a son, Dope Jr., that the wife took with her to Montana. But Dope missed the boy and went out there to be near him, and when I gathered, graduated from high school, he invited me for a visit. That's how I ended up in Montana in 1971. I had gone to spend the summer with Dope in the hunter's cabin up in the mountains. It was a little cottage with a big stone hearth and knotty pine paneling and color photos of the surrounding country. On the shelf above the hearth were some basketball trophies belonging to the guy who owned the place, a former college all-star now working as an ophthalmologist down in Dutton. Doe taught me how to fly fish. A fly rod had a lot of importance to Doe, as if being good with the thing was a key to the meaning of life or something. He had an image of himself standing in sunlight, fly rod in hand. He was mystical about the enterprise, though he didn't really have much ability. While I was staying with Doak, I met Hildy, my eventual ex-wife. She was a nurse in the hospital where Doak took me the night I met his new girlfriend, Samantha. I met Samantha about two hours before I met Hildy. Samantha had come home to Montana from San Francisco where she'd been with her crazy mother. Before I met her, many days before Doak had talked about her, about how beautiful and sexy she was. According to Doak, I just wasn't going to believe my eyes. He'd met her in a bar he used to frequent after working construction all day in Dutton. She was only 25. He told me all about her, day after day. We were drinking pretty heavy in the evenings, and he'd tell me about what she had gone through in her life. She's so beautiful to have to go through that stuff, he said, suicide and insanity and abuse. A lot of abuse. She's part Indian. She's had hard times. Her father was a full-blooded Cherokee. She's a genius. He killed himself. Then her mother went crazy and they put her in this institution for the insane over in San Francisco. Her mother doesn't know her own name anymore, or Samantha's pathetic, really. Think about it. And she looks like a goddess. I can't even find the words for it. Beautiful. Nobody in the world. Not even Hollywood. At the time, I was worried about being drafted into the army and was under a lot of stress. They were drafting everybody back then. And I was worried. I didn't want to hear about Doak's beautiful girlfriend. Man, he said, I wish I had her picture, a snapshot of her, so I could show you. But the Indian blood means she has this thing about having her picture taken, like it steals part of her soul. They all believe that. <coughs> he was talking about her the night she arrived, the traveling she'd done when she was a back dancer for the Rolling Stones. She knows Mick Jagger, man. And the heavy things she'd seen, abused children and illicit drugs and alcohol, and also the position she liked her in sex and the various ways they had of doing it together. She's an Indian, he said. They have all kinds of weird ways. <laughs> Could we go out on the porch or something? I said. He hadn't heard me. She wears a headband. It expresses her people. When she was six, her mother went crazy for the first time. A white woman, the mother, right? This poor girl from Connecticut with no idea what she was getting into, marrying this guy, coming out here to live almost like a pioneer. Only the guy turned out to be a wild man. They lived on the reservation. Nobody else wanted anything to do with him because of how he was. A true primitive, but a noble one, too. You should hear Samantha talk about it. He used to take her everywhere, and he had this crazy thing about rock concerts, like they were from the old days of the tribe. See, he'd go and dance and get really drunk. Samantha went with him until she was in her teens. She actually has a daughter from when they were traveling with the Rolling Stones. The daughter's staying, staying with her mother's sister back east. It's a hell of a story. She's only 25? He nodded. Had the daughter when she was 17. The Rolling Stones? Don't give me that look, he said. I smiled as big as I could. No, really. I, I wasn't. I just like to go outside. It's kind of stuffy, you it? Could be Mick Jagger's kid, my brother said significantly. Samantha knew him. Well, I said, hey, she'll be here soon. We better clean up a little. He poured himself another drink. What have we done in our lives? He, sta he said, staring at the table and looking sad. <coughs> I've worked a few jobs, bought a car here and there, got married and got divorced. And you, you graduated from high school, went to the prom, right? I mean, we haven't really experienced anything. Imagine having your father kill himself. 
How'd he do it, I asked. I told you, he said he shot himself. Damn, are you listening to me? A little while later, Samantha pulled in and we went out to get her to greet her. She'd been driving for two days, she told us. It was almost full dark, but from what I could see, she looked like death itself. <laughs> we all went inside and Doe poured more whiskey. He kept watching me, waiting for some sign, I suppose. I couldn't give him one. He built up so many of my expectations that I'd begun to think beyond what was really possible for a big, not too nice looking former high school football star with a pot belly and a double chin. Samantha wasn't pretty, not by a very, very, very long stretch. And it wasn't just the fact that she'd been sitting behind the wheel of a ratty carbon monoxide spewing car for two days. She could have just walked out of a beauty parlor after an all-afternoon session, and it wouldn't have made any difference. She did have nice dark hair, but her eyes were set deep in her skull, and they were crossed a little. They were also extremely small, the smallest eyes I ever saw, like a rodent's eye, black and with a scary glitter in them. They fixed on you as if you were something to eat and swallow. She was tall and had long legs, and she had hips wider than dokes. Her hair was shiny, crow black, and stiff. She let it grow wild, so it appeared that it hadn't seen a brush in her lifetime. She was not physically beautiful by any standard you care to name. Doke stood by staring, all moony-eyed and weeping <coughs> with booze and love, and I guess I couldn't keep the surprise out of my face. I had thought I was going to meet this beautiful woman. Instead, I'd met Samantha. I have to go freshen up, she said, after we'd been through the introductions. She went into the bathroom and closed the door with a delicate little click of the latch. Then we heard what sounded like water being poured out of a big vat into other water. Doe turned to me. Well, he said, right? Jesus Christ, I said. I thought he meant the sound. Isn't she beautiful? I said, right. Do you ever see anything, he said. He was standing by the table, tottering a little, holding on to the back of the chair. You know? I said, yeah. He pulled the chair out and sat down. He ran his hands through his hair. Just, he said, really. I nodded. Right, he said. I said, uh-huh. He picked up the bottle and drank, then shook his head. Something. Wow, I said. After another drink and a few seconds of staring off, he said, what's the matter with you? He still wasn't looking at me. I said, nothing. Why? He poured more whiskey and sat there and seemed to study it. You got something to say? Can't think of anything, I said. He looked at me, and I sat down, too. Well, he said, I don't like that look. She's been on the road, I said. She's tired. Not her, you. I don't like your look. <laughs> he ran my hands over my face. I thought you might think I was smirking at him. Oh, I said, I'm okay. That isn't what I mean, he said. I reached for the whiskey. I think I'll have some more of that, I told him. But all right with you? He didn't answer. He was thinking. So Anna came out of the bathroom. I didn't know what she'd done to freshen up. Nothing had changed at all. <laughs> she sat down and leaned back in the chair and clasped her hands behind her head. So this is your brother. That's him, Doak said. You're so little compared to Doak, it's strange. She went over and got herself a glass, brought it back to the table where Doak poured her some of the whiskey. I told Ignatius about your dad and mom, Doak said to her. She drank and shook her head. Terrible. She looked a lot older than 25. She had little gold rings piercing her ears. The rings went all the way up the side of each ear. This was the first time I ever saw that phenomenon. I got a baby that's severely retarded. The oxygen wasn't right. Doke seemed surprised. You never said she was retarded. That's what I said. She nodded, sadly. She was watching me. My father took me to Altamont. I was there. I know Mick Jagger. Might be his kid, Doak said, all excited, right? She seemed to think this over. No, I doubt it. But it could be, though, right? She frowned. No. Didn't you, Doak said, then stop. He was confused. We saw them. We were close, you know, but not that close. Nobody said anything. I was watching Doak because I couldn't look at Samantha. The, di the difference between his description of her and the reality was too much. He said, well, I thought you said the kid was Jagger's kid. I suppose it could be. I had so many lovers back then. <laughs> you mean you might not have noticed it was Mick Jagger? I said. She looked at me. Why do you look at me like that, she said. Doak took a drink. He was thinking. I said something to smooth things over. I have a kind of face that makes people think I'm being smart with them. 
He's always got that look, Doug said. Where is your kid, I asked her. She said, with my mother's family back east. <clears throat> my father was killed by the government for protesting against him. I thought your father killed himself, Doug said. He did. We waited for her to clear up the mystery. The government drove him to it. Hell, I said. She nodded importantly. The government is not legitimate, you know, as long as there are whites living on Indian lands. Which Indian lands, I said. The whole country. <laughs> oh, you mean like the Constitution and all that? That's not valid. Right, she said. Not much chance of that going away, I said. <laughs> My father was a full-blooded Cherokee, she said. Doak told you, I'm sure. I told him, Doak said. I told him about that, and I told him about the Rolling Stones. It wasn't just the Rolling Stones. I traveled a lot. I had 300 lovers before I was 22. Doak shook his head. Looking for love, I said. She said, at least 300 of them. Lovers, I said. She nodded. What was it that interested you about them, if you don't mind my asking? Her little eyes were on me and her face twisted as if she smelled something bad. What? Are you making fun, Doug asked me. His face was a total blank. No, I said, I was truly curious. For that many lovers, it was hard to imagine that there wouldn't be some sort of filing system to keep track of the pipes. <laughs> Doug was staring at me, so I put my hand over my mouth, which I had come to think of as the offending part of my face. He shook his head again and poured more whiskey. I sat back and pretended to be relaxed and interested while Samantha talked about herself and her adventures. She was related to Crazy Horse, he said, and on her mother's side there was a distant connection to Mary Lincoln. She had lived in Haight-Ashbury and attended the University of California at Berkeley, majoring in law. She had plans to enter the system and ruin it from the inside. The collapse of the American government was the only hope for her and her people. But her father had this thing about rock concerts, so she got sidetracked. For years, she followed the Grateful Dead around from concert to concert. She knew Jerry Garcia well. She had a child by him that died, and it was why she loved to seek out the Rolling Stones. She liked their names better. Once, when she was only 13, she'd met John F. Kennedy. Doak sipped the whiskey watching me. I was beginning to get sleepy. She droned on. She'd been a member of the Weathermen, and the FBI had crushed them with bombs and fire and filtrators. Doak was staring at me, waiting for the first sign that I wasn't utterly charmed. But I was actively fighting sleep. He had a big stake in her, and I didn't want to hurt his feelings. Samantha had fixed me with her rodent's eyes, but my eyes were so heavy, and I rubbed them and put my hands over a yawn. I'm very sensitive to spiritual vibrations, she said. It's my Indian blood. This was in reference to something I must have missed in the long monologue because Doug said, so that's how you knew he was going to kill himself. Yes, yeah, she said, but there wasn't anything I could do. It was his karma. She went on to talk about karma and how a person's karma caused a glow she could perceive. I'm very perceptive. She said, I can sense what a person is thinking. I get vibes from people. I was thinking, please stop talking. <laughs> it's really kind of uncanny, she went on. I look in a person's eyes and I see all their thoughts, their innermost feelings. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> I was thinking, go to bed. She never seemed to take a breath. She said, I learned this when I met Robert Kennedy at his house in the Queen, Virginia. I was 18 and I think he was interested in me physically too. It was so odd how he met me. I just walked up and knocked on his door and his, mind, his maid, Eva was her name. Well, I sure am beat, I said. I was desperate now. Yes, I'll turn in. I was telling you something, she said. I said, you must be awful tired. I was in the middle of telling you something, and you just started talking about turning in. <laughs> she seemed to pout. I caught myself actually feeling sorry for her. We've been keeping you up, I said. You must be exhausted. I stood, vaguely intending to, take, to make polite conversation as I left the room. She was telling you something, Doak said. Do you have an Indian name? I asked Samantha. She shook her head. My mother insisted that I be given a white woman's <coughs> name. She knew I would have a terrible time growing up in a white man's world. I didn't say anything. She added, it would have split me in two. You know how terrible it is to be split down the middle? She reached over and played with the crown of Doak's hair. I said, I suppose I didn't. I yawned. She said, it's much worse than you can imagine. And I'm sorry it bores you. She seemed proud to have plumbed my feelings. I'm fine, I said, just tired. And then there didn't seem to be anything else to talk about. She sat there, she was biting her nails, taking in the room with those little eyes. I had come to the realization that she was no more of Indian blood than I was the king of Spain. <laughs> I had an image of her parents, a couple of Italians, probably holding down an apartment in Brooklyn, wondering where their daughter ran off to. I 
said, what's Mick Jagger like? Very grungy and nervous, she said, still biting her nails. I said, everything you've told us is a crop, right? You can disbelieve me if you want, she said. I don't care. I looked at Doak, man, I said. Then I started out of the room, bedtime. But Doak stood suddenly, and when I turned, he took me by the front of my shirt. You think you can treat us like this? I said, okay, look, I'm sorry. I didn't mean anything. Leave him be, Samantha he said. It's his loss. Will you excuse us for a few seconds, Doak said to her. She got up and went outside. We could join her, she said, when we were through being babies. She closed the door and Doak walked me back against the wall, still holding my shirt in his fist. I saw the way you were looking at her. What difference does it make what I think, I said, a mistake. Oh, he said, what do you think? Cut it out, I said, come on, let's, let me go. Not till you tell me what you think of Samantha. I think she's a liar, I told him. And she's not even a very good one. I couldn't help myself. And on top of that, I think she's ugly as month old pizza. <laughs> he commenced hitting me. He was swinging wildly, and some of his punches missed, each which allowed me to get under the table. Then he started kicking. I was crawling around trying to get away from him, and Samantha had come back in to stop him. When he stormed out into the dark, she got down on the floor and saw that I was bleeding from a gash on my forehead. I must have hit the edge of the table on my way under it, and she was really quite gentle and sweet, getting me a rag from my head and insisting that Dope would take me down to Dutton, to the emergency room. As I said, it was while I was in the hospital that I met Hildy. That's a nasty cut, was the first thing she said to me. Yes, ma'am, I said. I thought she was perfect. I wouldn't expect anyone else to think so necessarily. <clears throat> How'd it happen, she said. My brother and I got in a fight. She shook her head, concentrating on her work, cutting a bandage to size for me. Two grown boys like you. I could tell you about it, I said. That was all it needed. My mother used to say, when the time is right, you don't need to have a committee meeting about it. <laughs> when I eventually returned to the cabin, I found that Samantha had gone. She had picked up and headed off into the west with a few of Doak's records and tapes and most of the money he'd saved. He took it pretty hard. For a while that summer, he had himself convinced that because she'd taken those things, she was planning on coming back. Mm -hmm. But the months turned into the rest of the year, and I stayed on through the next spring and part of that summer, and she was just gone. His drinking got pretty bad, and I started having to look out for the boy a lot on the weekends. It's not fair, I know it, Doak said to me. I can't shake it, though. You gotta get a hold of yourself, I told him. I had been seeing Hildy. We were married at the end of that next summer, and for a while, Doak's boy lived with us while Doak dried out in rehab. The boy's mother was in some sort of rehab herself, drugs. Sometimes back then it seemed to me that the whole country had gone crazy. Hildy and I were together almost 20 years. We never had any children. Doak left Montana and lives in Seattle now, and he's happy. Some stories do have happy endings for a while, anyway. He's got a wife and another boy and a girl. He probably never thinks about Samantha. I used to imagine the Italian couple in Brooklyn reunited with their wayward little girl who pulled up one day driving a car full of music and money. <laughs> she was such a bad liar. Doke's son married a nice girl from Catalina and then moved to New York City. Everybody got along fine, really. Hilda and I lived for a few years in a little three-bedroom rambler on Coronado Street in Sandusky, Illinois. Those first years we had a lot of fun usually. Now and then she'd lose her temper and my old trouble would return. Something about my face would cause her to start swinging at me. <laughs> and I never hit back, but it doesn't, as the saying goes, take two to make a fight. One person with a nurse to get somebody else is enough. For the person getting knocked out, it might as well be the heavyweight championship. One night when we were drinking, I told her about Samantha. I must have been a little careless in how I talked about Samantha's physical qualities because I upset Hildy. These days you say something about one woman and you've said it about all of them. Is that the way you see us, she says. Us? I said, what? Is that how you judge women? You see that I'm gaining weight, don't you? And do you see me like this Samantha person? I said, I'm just saying she wasn't what Doak said she was. It just kills me that that's how you think. For about a year, things had been going sour. Tildy had ballooned to about 250 pounds. I had lost weight and I was worried all the time about money. So was she, but her worry came out differently. She kept asking me what I thought of her. You think I'm ugly now, she'd say. Right? That's how you see me. Why don't you come out and say it? I think you're fine, I'd say. <coughs> Tell me the truth, I'm too big. 
No, I'd say, really, hon. You're lying. I can see it in your face. My face again. There was nothing I could say, and besides, I was about half her size by now. Once I said, do you think you're too big? It's not important what I think, she said, because God damn it, I know how you think, all of you. We needed extra income, and she hated the idea of nursing anymore, so she got a job serving food at a hospital cafeteria across the river in Missouri. There were nights we didn't say a thing to each other, and after a few months, she started going, doing things to get shut of me. That was okay. I think I even understood. She made dates with a janitor on her floor, a man 15 years older than I am and a lot bigger. She told people she was leaving me. She had friends over at all hours of the day and night. When I walked in and someone asked me who I was, asked who I, and if someone asked who I was, she'd wave me away. That's my soon be ex, she'd say. It was always said like a joke, but you could feel the edge to it. I never answered. I went about my business and tried not to get mad. She was as big as a Buick. She weighed more than my whole family put together, <laughs> including dope. I never mentioned that the bed sagged on her side and that I was having to replace the mattress every six months. I'd watch her settle into her seat in a steak joint, order a porterhouse the size of an infant, and I wouldn't say a word. I said nothing about her jeans, which were big enough to throw over a rhinoceros. <laughs> The night she kicked me out, she came home with a new friend, a new lover, she told me. She made her lover wait out on the front lawn while she broke the news. Do you understand, Ignatius? I want you out. I've decided I don't need a man to tell me who I am. I can stay until you find a place, sleep on the sofa, but Grace is moving in with us. Grace had walked into the hospital cafeteria several weeks before. After having been bandaged up in the emergency room, she'd been in a traffic accident, and her nose and upper lip were cut. Hildy and she got to talking, and pretty soon they were meeting for drinks after Hildy's shifts. It was just like Hildy and me in a way, except that now she was deciding that she wanted a woman and not a man. I never thought much of myself, but this hurt me. She's the most interesting person I've ever been around, Hildy said, and you and I haven't seen, been anything to each other for a long time. This was true. Grace walked up to the door, and Hildy opened it and stepped back for her to come in, acting like this was the grand entrance of her happiness. Grace had a big white bandage over her nose, but we weren't in the room more than 15 minutes before I recognized Samantha. <laughs> Blonde this time, a few pounds heavier, and with a fuller in the face, but unmistakably her. Hello, Grace. She looked at me with those little black eyes and then sat on the couch next to Hildy. I went into the bedroom and started packing, throwing shirts and suitcase and some slacks and socks and underwear. I wasn't sure what I should take with me. I could hear Samantha Grace in the next room. She had built her own house, she was saying, and had learned how to play several musical instruments, but then forgot how. <laughs> she had spent the night with Sting during a thunderstorm and power outage in Atlanta. By the time I got back to the living room, she was talking about Mount St. Helen. She was there when it blew. She almost died. <laughs> Ever been on the reservation, I asked her. I was putting a few of my books into my suitcase. They both looked at me as though I had trees growing out of my head. Reservation? Samantha Grace asked. I couldn't tell if she recognized me. She stared and then she smiled. So I smiled back and resumed packing. She said, I've done so much wandering around. I've been in almost every state of the Union and made love in each one of them, too. I always wanted to go to Hawaii, Hildy said, laughing. Oh, absolutely. I've been there. I, married and, I was married and lived there, but I got divorced. Must have been a tough week. I put in. <laughs> it was a nasty thing to say, and it was the wrong time to say it. It didn't look bad. I said, little joke, girls. Oh, Samantha Grace said, haw. Hildy shook her head, and then, haw, haw, Samantha Grace said. Ever been to Montana, I asked her. I worked in the emergency ward down at the hospital in Dutton, Hildy said. A terrible, lonely job. That's where I had the misfortune of meeting Ignatius. Mm -hmm. And Samantha Grace smiled and leaned back in her chair. My name is not one that a person forgets easily. And you remember somebody as small as I am, too. She stared at me with those little wolverine's eyes and kept smiling. Clasping her hands behind her blonde head, Samantha Grace said, well, you know, I guess I, to be truthful, I'd have to say I never was actually in Montana. That's one of the few places I've never been. Couldn't help it. My laugh came up out of me like a sneeze. I laughed and laughed and went on laughing so hard that Hilda got mad. And the matter she got, the more I laughed. Before I had stopped laughing, she'd thrown all my things out on the lawn. This was the last night of my marriage. I knew that. <laughs>